Okay then, folks, welcome back to Brew Time. Uh, this week I'm chatting with Chris Donaldson, author of this incredible book. We're going to go into into this in depth, but I urge you, if you're if you're into your overland travel, overland travel, biking, uh, or just fancy a bit of an adventure, this is the book to read. It's called Going the Wrong Way. Uh, Chris, welcome. Thank you, Chris. Good to see you. Uh, and you, mate. And you. Now, I mean, you've kept this. You kept this adventure close to your heart. <laughs> Bear in mind, you did this in the late 70s to early 80s, and you didn't write this yeah. book until, what, three years ago? Two, three years ago? Well, I sort of did and I didn't. I started writing the book when I got back because I thought, I realized, I don't think anybody's ever done something like this before. And of course, before the internet, you didn't have the sort of yeah. information overload that we have now. So I started writing the book and I got three, well, halfway, I got the manuscript done, I guess. And then I read somebody came in with a book called Jupiter's Travels by <laughs> Ted Simon. Yeah. And I thought, you bugger. <laughs> <laughs> you've done it. You've beat me to it. So I gave up the whole thing and put it in the drawer oh. and got on with life. And um, I cursed Ted Simon up and down, I can tell you. But uh, I was lucky enough to, um, man, just a year before I published the book, I got talking to him and he invited me down to his house in the south of France. Yeah. And he was able to give me some great tips about writing and so on and so forth. And we sat and talked about traveling in the 70s and 80s. Really lovely guy. So it was all sort of turned full circle of that. But yeah, I actually started in 70, started in 1980, right? 81, writing a book. Mm -hmm. And I finished in 2000. So it's a very long, drawn out affair. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll tell you what. I, I didn't read it. I listened to it. I bought the, the audio book. Um, my missus is a big reader, but I... Like I'm, I, I like to listen to, to stuff, you know, when yeah. I'm doing other things. So I bought the audio book and literally, I think in about three sessions, I finished it. It is the guy you, you, the guy you've got reading the book does a fantastic job of bringing it all alive. Yeah. Obviously your writing is, is, <laughs> is the backbone of that. But uh, yeah, the audio book is, is brilliant. So Chris, can Thanks you tell us a little bit about um, like, what was it that you did? What was it that I did? Well, <laughs> I guess um, coming from Belfast, Northern Ireland, was in the brought up in the seventies, wasn't the best place to hang around. There wasn't an awful lot going on apart from bombs and bullets going off, as far as the social life's concerned. So, like a lot of the guys my age, we wanted to get out of town, and get away somewhere, and I thought Australia would be a great, a great place to go to. And um, I remember when I was about sixteen, I just bought a BSA Bantam. And I read a story in the Motorcycle News about this girl who just who was currently riding around the world in a motorcycle on mm. a BSA Bantam. So I thought, geez, I could do that. I've got a Bantam. So I decided that's the way I would get to Australia. I'd ride the motorbike to India and ship a bike from there to Australia. Uh, not a Bantam. I hasten to add a Bantam could hardly get me to school in the morning. So I went <laughs> to Australia. But that was the start of the notion in my head. And if you remember back when you were 16, you get some silly ideas in your head, you just sort of, and you just run with it, you know? Yeah. So that was the start of my, the, the seed was planted, if you like. And of course, when I decided when I was 21 and had a few quid, finished my education, thought I'll head off to Australia now, I had a much better bike for that out of Morigazi Le Mans, which is not, not everybody's ideal tour, but it's the bike I had at the time and the bike I decided to go on. Yeah. Why? Why Australia? What was it about Australia that that like lit the fire for you? I think it was, in those days it was either America or Australia because uh. I never did very good at French or languages, so it had to be somewhere spoke English or some version yeah. of it. And uh, I had relations over there, and I was going to get a job, sell the bike, and maybe stay. You know, mm -hmm. so it was it was get out get out of town and maybe come back, maybe not. I was going to see what happened. You know, so it was a one way yeah. ticket. Uh, so just whatever notion I had for Australia, which I still have, seemed like a good place to go to. Now you, uh, uh, we'll we'll uh, we'll spoil it a little bit. Spoiler alert for people: you didn't actually make it to Australia on that trip when you first set off. Like in the was it nineteen seven? Was it seventeen nine? Seventy eight? Seventy nine? Seventy nine. Seventy nine. Off. So I ended up in Argentina a year and a half later. So it's. Hence the title of the book, Going the Wrong Way. Yeah. Uh, 
so yeah, I left left meant to leave in September, left in October. Uh, got delayed getting visas and stuff in London, having a good time. And then just was about to leave London and the Ayatollah Khomeini decided to take over the American embassy in, in Iran. Mm-hmm. And that basically closed the road east. So after sort of five years of planning and working out where I was going to go, I actually had a, the AA used to give you, would have given you, not a, really give a roadmap, obviously, but just guidebooks and they would give you a detailed list of places to go along the way, printed uh-huh. off in paper. So I left, basically left on my way to go to Australia, and all of a sudden, I had nowhere to go. I couldn't stay in Europe because it was November, and the motorbike's no fun, so I thought, well, may as well go to Africa. There's nowhere else to go. So I headed down south, just heading for the sun. Um, so at the time, it was a disaster because it was the, you know, the whole planning, the whole idea of the trip was gone. I thought, well, I thought it'd get, if it got down to Kenya, I could take a boat from there to India or across to Australia from there. But basically it was fly by wire, fly by the seat of my pants at that stage. Because again, it's hard to remember back, but before the internet, you had guidebooks. The yeah. guidebooks were basically out of date after they were printed in a way. Absolutely. But, you know, I had no idea, but of sort of third form geography as to what was in Africa. What was in the Middle East? Uh, I was really flying blind wherever I was going to go. Really didn't know where I was go- where I was going to go. What I was going to find when I got there, you know. I mean, it, your your story, literally from the word go, your whole story to me is a lesson in never giving up. And that's what I tell people all the time: is just that, like, you know, set your eyes on the prize. Don't worry about how you get there. Set your eyes on the prize and just deal with what comes your way and if you have to take a few steps back or you've got to go to the side over it under it whatever you need to do just deal with it and just keep going just keep going well even now i mean that's what overland motorcycling is all about you know they, once you get out of europe you don't mm. know what's going to happen next yeah. um there's borders there's political tensions there's money problems Civil you wars. Get <laughs> Civil wars whatever <laughs> you know these things that's what you're there for in a way is is to meet to come up against these obstacles and to get over them and that's real it was a great life lesson because that's what life is is meeting up obstacles and getting over them absolutely absolutely and i think the other thing that that sort of if if you are sort of generations and maybe one or two generations say after me you'll remember a time when there was no internet, there was no GPS, you know, sat navs in your cars or anything, and you used to navigate via maps and that. Trying to comprehend what, you know, what you did, what Ted Simon did, and and all the people, you know, from who were traveling in the 60s, 70s, 80s, even the 90s, you know, people who were traveling around the world then. To me, it's just like, I, I, I did it. I did it 2012 to 2014. So we had the internet by then. We had very basic sort of sat navs. So it yeah. was, you know, and and if I if I had any problems, well, I could generally find Wi-Fi somewhere, and I could just, you know, put a call out on social media. Is anyone near here? Can anyone help? I mean, you literally, you you were solely relying on people round about you, the kindness of strangers, and it comes over again in your book that. You can rely on that to an extent. Obviously, you know you had a you had your fair running with with strangers <laughs> as you were coming down through Africa for sure. <laughs> but you you definitely had people who helped, didn't you? You know, you met people, locals and other travellers who helped. Well, I think one of the great things about motorcycling is people like motorbikes and they're generally yeah. like motorcyclists and they're generally nice to motorcyclists. I mean, people think, oh, we got hell's angels, we got bad people on motorbikes, but generally people. Are, most blokes like motorbikes, whether they ever have one or not. If they had one, they all the better. And most girls have a notion for blokes and motorbikes, obviously, because we're good looking, generally. <laughs> <laughs> so they are a great, uh, they're a great breaker of the ice when you arrive in a small yeah. town or a big town, wherever you are, they break the ice, people come over and talk to you. So rather than standing at the corner of a train station with the rock, rucksack in your back, you're sitting there with a big red, Italian motorbike, people notice you and say, well, what are you doing here? And so it's a great conversation starter. Yeah, and definitely. And after that, hopefully you can meet the right guys or whatever, you know, mm-hmm. and the life takes over, you know, 
conversation starts and you hopefully get on with them, you know? Can you can you give people a, a, a sort of rough idea, you know, I don't expect you to go through it verbatim, but a rough idea of the route you took, certainly down to South Africa? Yeah, well, obviously I left London and left Belfast, London and London and the end of October, the beginning of November, I think it was November the 5th or 6th was whenever the Islamic Revolution happened in Tehran. So I just wanted down to Greece as quick as I could to get some heat. Uh-huh. And then <laughs> uh, the idea was to take a boat to Egypt, but the boat to Egypt wasn't wasn't sailing. So we took a boat to Israel and they're reckoning that well, Israel's beside Egypt. So once we get there, we can cut across. Of course, there was uh, also, it wasn't quite as bad as it is now, but we couldn't get out of Egypt, out into Egypt from Israel, couldn't get out of Jordan. So I had to take a boat, boat back to Cyprus and then over to Syria, which was uh, a bit scary, and then through Jordan, and then another boat right around to Aqaba in Egypt. Mm-hmm. So it was a really long way around uh, the Middle East, which was a bit of a disaster at the time because it took too much money. And one of my main problems, in, you know, when you come out of university, you've got no money, you work part-time. Money was always a big issue. Um, so I ended up in Egypt in Christmas 1980 and then uh, headed south thinking there must be a road. Well, I thought there would be a road and a railway across the desert. I ended up driving the motor across 500 miles of sand, <laughs> which is probably one of the stupidest things I've ever done. <laughs> but, but also one of the most... Uh, Somebody said the best thing about it, the best adventures are the ones that are hell at the time, but you can look back and think greatly of things of them, great things of them in the pub many years to come, you know. And that's they're that's the ones you remember, them. isn't it? When it goes wrong, yeah. when when you're just thinking, Why the hell did I do this? Just whose idea exactly. was this? That's when you remember yeah. it for sure. Yeah. <laughs> so Sudan was certainly one of the hardest countries to go through because there was no roads. I think there was about ten miles of tarmac in the whole country. Um a few adventures in a train down to the south of Sudan. And then Come on, you've, you've got to go into that. You've got to cover that, the issues on the train. Well, we could, couldn't, couldn't, we knew there was no petrol in Juba, so we carried a couple of jerry cans with me on the train. And then I got arrested for having two jerry cans of petrol on the train, which I thought was a bit much because there was guys with bow and arrows, hatchets, <laughs> guns, everything I like had on the train. I thought, yeah. I'm just sitting here with a couple of tins of petrol and you're arresting me. What's the deal here, guys? You know, but they didn't see it like that. But uh, it was quite an adventurous rail trip. It took about two or three days to cover four or five hundred miles on a, on a train down to Sudan, down to Juba. We got there, there was no petrol, so stuck there for a week or so, managed to get some petrol. I got to Juba after another 500 miles off the road on the bike, which was basically disintegrating as I went along. Mm-hmm. At that stage, um, what it goes were never made for dirt tracking, but <laughs> they're actually very good at <laughs> Yeah, they, they, they didn't have the most um, reliable reputation, did they? I think they're a lot better yeah. now, the Moto Guzzies, but uh, yeah, <laughs> you tested that. Well, the engine was always solid, it was well tested, so yeah. So I ended uh, Uganda just after the Amin had got, it, got dethroned from uh, Kampala. He was still at large summer. So Kampala was a bit dodgy. Um, and really, at, at that stage, it was it was pretty chaotic because it, I had a map of North Africa, which went down to the south of Sudan. So I actually drove off the edge of my map <laughs> without finding it. was only when I got to Kenya, I could find somebody with a map that could give me for Southern Africa to see where I was actually going <laughs> next. Yeah. So it was that sort of chaos. But as I say, that was what part of the, at that stage, it was realizing that the, one of the beauties about traveling is not knowing what's going to happen next and mm-hmm. meeting the unexpected and um, enjoying the, the chaos that happens, if you like, which is, it goes against everything we've been brought up to do. We've been brought up to plan everything and doing it in an organized fashion. Yeah. And to, to go against that, it's not planning what's happening tomorrow, not know what's happening tomorrow. It's really, there's very few people who live their lives like that these days. But it's you know, quite liberating, isn't it? Once you're, totally. once you're on, when you're on the road for a prolonged length of time, like I've said it before on, on this podcast, it, it takes a while for me. It took about six to eight weeks before it stopped being 
just you know a, a biking holiday, a biking trip, and it becomes life. And then, as you said, it just it just becomes life, doesn't it? You just become used to not knowing where you're going to find fuel, not knowing where you're going to yeah. spend that night. It's just part of just everyday life. Yeah, you don't worry. You know, if you're going to trying to get to Kampala and you don't get there tonight, well, it doesn't matter. You get there tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. What's the day matter? You know, whereas working in the West, you know, an hour matters. If you're an hour late for something, it's, it's a big deal. Whereas, in, it's, you know, you, when you're traveling a day here, a day there, it doesn't matter. If you miss mm -hmm. a day if you go and see something else. It's all part of the, the tapestry of what's happening, you know. Have Which you, way, have did you, you did, sorry, go on. Did you go down Africa at all in your journey? Yeah. Yeah, um, I my plan was to circumnavigate Africa, go down the west, and come back up at the, up the east. But uh, mm. it all went a bit wrong for me in Mauritania. Um, when I went, the Boko Haram Islamic fundamentalists, you know, they were exploding out of Central Africa. You know, they're the ones that yeah. kidnapped the Nigerian schoolgirls. Well, they'd sacked Mali, and they were starting to come into Mauritania as I was coming from like Western Sahara. So the government flooded the there's, there's two roads um, crossing the Sahara there, and they flooded the roads with checkpoints, you know, police and, and military yeah. checkpoints. And um, like it was my first real taste of overland travel outside of the West, you know. And like yeah, I, yeah. I remember arriving in Morocco and shitting myself. And like I've been to Morocco Pretty ten times now, and Morocco is just so yeah. nice and friendly, isn't it? But at the time, yeah, it, it, yeah. it was just like, wow, what's this? So when I got to Mauritania, and like. I remember the border guard, the policeman from Western Sahara, shaking my hand and saying "bon chance," you know, good luck, and just looking at yeah. me like, "You're you're fucked, yeah. mate," you know. <laughs> and when I went yes. in there, I basically just got robbed every single time I met the police. I got robbed, and um, I know now it's just it's a normal sort of interaction with the police. They point guns at you and they'll ask questions, and that's just you money. What, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, sometimes, yeah. But um, I was just getting robbed all the time, and I ended up snapping my frame, and then uh, I got I got taken by a gang at Rosso for a while, and you know they pretty much relieved me of quite a lot of money. Um, so uh -huh. I got through that, and then was just like, forget, well, forget West Africa. So I ended up back in London, um, and then from there I I headed off uh, basically east, and right. missed out Africa this time. Went across like Russia and down down to Oz and across to the Americas. Yeah. Um yeah. I was gonna say, like, that mentality, that that mentality you develop when you're traveling of, oh well, you know, we'll just deal with whatever comes. Has that stayed with you? Unfortunately, yes. <laughs> I screwed up screwed up quite a few situations in my life since then. <laughs> <laughs> but it's always been good fun. But I probably would have made a lot more money and had a much easier time if I hadn't had yeah. that attitude. And going the wrong way is not just a, a title of a journey. It's a, sort of a it's just a bit of a lifestyle choice as well. Yeah, it's yeah. A bit of that in the book as well. Um, I've always tried to, not always tried to, but it's always just happened, it seemed to happen to fall into doing the wrong thing at the wrong time or end up in the wrong place or with the wrong people. You know, but it's made life a lot more interesting. Uh, I, I, we've never met before this, Chris, have we? But, but like listening to the book. And, and experience experiencing your uh, journey and there go bits of your life through this book. You strike me as the very like epitome of free spirit. You know, you you are your own person. You're your own man. You make your decision, and you know that's that. If you don't want to do it, fine. But I'm going to do I'm going to do it this way. Yeah, well, I've been lucky or unlucky enough to be self employed most of my life, and yeah. I've done a few, been able to live that to an extent. So certainly. Um, at the age of 65 sort of looking at retirement thinking where did my pension go and that sort of thing <laughs> probably would have been better off working in the bank but I've had a good time <laughs> yeah yeah. Um, so after Africa you ended up back home didn't you? You ended up back in Belfast yeah well I got to, got to Kenya and I couldn't afford the boat to go to India or to go to Australia so I basically had to give up on that so the idea then was to get to Cape Town and to Africa and then sell the bike and try and do whatever, get home whatever money I could get from selling a bike. But I got to Cape Town and I um, was lucky enough. Luck is a funny thing. It happens to you when you're least expecting it. But there was a yacht race going across from Indonesia uh, to Europe. 
and one of the guys on the boat had come off, stopped in Cape Town and hurt his leg. So I got his position in the boat, which was kind of cheating because this is an international yacht race, a bit like a Volvo, a bit like the, uh, the was it the Volvo Ocean Race, which are, uh-huh. it's like Formula One of Formula yeah. One of yacht racing. Yeah. And I basically got on a job in the boat after sailing dinghies in the Sea Scouts. <laughs> uh, so it was a bit of fast learning to go from there to from being a motor, solo motorcyclist for six months to being a part of a crew of eight, yeah. eight people sailing five weeks across South and North Atlantic. So I sailed back to Europe um, after a few fun and games as well. A rudder broke off in the middle of this North Atlantic, which we had to get that sorted out in Cape Verde. Uh, got back to Europe. And luckily enough, the sponsor of the yacht race was a was a shipping company. So they shipped a the bike. They were going to ship it home for me. And I said, well, where else do you go? And I said, well, wherever you want to go. And I said, well, what about America? And I said, yeah, send it to Los Angeles. So I was able to pick up a bike three months later in Los Angeles. And it was, uh, it was pretty wrecked. It was been sitting on the docks for three months and the, the clutch had seized up. So I had the ride the whole way up from uh, Los Angeles up to Seattle, which is up in Washington near Canada. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was about 1,200 miles with no clutch. Jesus. Which is uh, a lot of push starts. I mean, obviously in a motorbike, you can change, once you get started, you can change gear by kicking it in and by the gears. Um, but to get started at satellites, they had to push start the bike, jump on it and kick it into gear and get started. Blimey. So there's a lot of... I did a lot of freeway driving at that stage. <laughs> Just keep moving. Um, yeah, like you didn't exactly have support along the way. You know, obviously you did a solo journey, but a lot of people have support back home, you know, from their families. Your family was pretty anti you going away, weren't they? Yeah, I mean, it sort of. Um... My dad had me lined up when I was happy enough to join the family business for we're selling furniture, furniture mm-hmm. shop. And uh, he was wanting me to start straight off after Polytech. And I thought, no, I need to get away for a bit. So no, it was pretty much on my own financially. And well, so it wasn't in those days there wasn't a lot of support you could get from home anyway. I mean mm. to phone I remember phoning home from Egypt and it took all day to get through. You had to book a call in the tele, in the post office, it's in a cubicle, and it was about five quid, which is probably 50 quid now to make a five minute call home yeah. at Christmas, you know? So it was, you were pretty much, I think the whole in six months of his way in Africa, probably rang home three times, you know? So as a parent now, looking back, it must've been a nightmare for my parents to be fair. Yeah. yeah. Um, whereas nowadays, no matter where you go, you know, recently crying across Cindy, you just pick up your mobile phone and dial home every, every day, every night, yeah. you know, for, yeah, absolutely. for Um, but no, I mean, I left to go to Australia. I reckon it would take me three or four months and <laughs> cost me about a thousand quid, which would probably be about four or five grand nowadays. But at this stage, I'd been away for a year on four or five grand with including petrol money and everything else. So you can imagine yeah. it's pretty tight. Yeah. Living pretty, pretty low in the hog. Uh, did a work, worked in America for a couple of months, got a few quid, but. Looking back, one of my biggest obstacles of the whole thing was not having enough money mm-hmm. for parts or beer or food in that order. Yeah, like your um, the, the American uh, section of the of this whole trip, it, it struck me that you know it, it was almost like you'd you'd found a place where you kind of felt at home. That's kind of how it came across to me is that it became more of a pull to get going again because you 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 kind of felt settled where you were. Is is that is that fair? Yeah, I mean, I worked in North Carolina for a couple of months. And got a, had a girlfriend, and met a mm. crowd of guys I liked. And after you've been on the road for a year, sort of hard, sort of especially in the likes of Africa, you when you stop for a couple of months, it's, so you do get settled very quickly. You get quite feel quite at home. I felt very at home in the states yeah. and North Carolina. So it was a at one stage it was buying should I just stay or should I go? Yeah. Um, and when I was certainly in South America, I tended to think back as the states as being home rather than Belfast wow. was so far away. It was yeah, yeah, ancient history by that stage, even though it was only a year ago. Um, when you're traveling and so much is happening every day, 
time sort of um uh, what's the word shrinks mm. to an extent that a day becomes a month sort of thing nearly so much happens because in living in the working in a normal job you know so much you can go a whole week without anything exciting happening whereas you're traveling yeah. on the road every day is something happening so it's time of color camera what the word is shrinks not expands anyway but it becomes ever so much more focused on what's going on at the moment rather than yeah it becomes all about uh, the now doesn't it the now and the, now, the next and corner the yeah yeah and what had happened before i left on the trip was really not important anymore it was like ancient history so yeah i mean america was a very different experience from africa but probably as i say because so much had happened that happened in africa uh I felt at home in the states and it's having such a good time as well. yeah <laughs> that was a good track. It was, well, it was a bit of a booze cruise compared to going to Africa, you know. <laughs> yeah, you you, uh, you you strike me as a, a fairly social character. You you certainly, if there was a beer to be had or a woman to meet, you seem to, <laughs> you seem to get your fair share as you travel. Well, I was twenty one for God's sake. I yeah. know, I know. I, I was you just reading that going. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's like this. This lad is living his life. Absolutely. <laughs> Um, well, one of the reasons I got my nephew uh, Ben Doak to to do the narration rather than myself is I thought it's really not right to have a sixty-five-year-old man talking about picking up young nurses and drinking beers and whatever uh, at the stage in my life. It'd be better having somebody of the same age doing that, sort of reading the story. Yeah. Uh-huh. I think that hopefully came out better. A hundred percent. That's a, your nephew. I didn't realise he was your nephew. Yeah. He does a fantastic job. He brings the whole book alive. It's it's so yeah. good. He's a bit of a rock star. He plays in the uh, the cavern in Liverpool. The minute it's does he? called the uh, the uh, gondolas. So he's he wants to be a narrator. If anybody wants to take him on, <laughs> honestly, folks, I'll leave links down below. Um, for you can get the book on Amazon, but you can get the audio book as well. I think I got it on Audible. Um, it's well worth it. Honestly, well worth. We'll, we will not do it justice. We're not going to be able to cover. You know, we've we've literally just covered Africa like that, but Africa is a huge part of this book, and you just you won't you won't believe the experiences Chris had as he was going through Africa. I mean, it's it's like a Hollywood action adventure movie, but it was real. Um, it must have been quite cool for your nephew. Is it Ben? Did you say? Yeah, yeah. It must have been quite cool for him to sort of read the book and and. You know, really relive your experience through the book. What what does he make of it all? Yeah, he uh, saw a different side of me, certainly. Yeah. Um, but you know yourself, whenever you come back from one of these trips, people say, "How did you get on?" And you start telling them, and people very quickly lose interest because they don't really give yeah. a shit. Yeah. <laughs> we're just they were just being polite, asking you sort of thing. Yeah. So for I suppose a guest for forty years, people say, "Well, what about your trip down around the world on the motorbike?" I say, "Yeah, it's great, but every." You sort of know they're not really that interested. And you don't really want to go into that much detail either when you're standing in the bar, you know? Yeah, yeah. So it was quite um, uh, and interesting, let's say, for my friends and family to finally get the story written down in detail, you yeah. know? Yeah, I'll bet. I'll bet. I get... Um... I get, uh, my whole trip was called Teapot One. There's a long story, but the trip was called Teapot One. And one of my mates, uh, if he's with me and somebody comes up and starts asking about the the trip or or something like that, he just sort of looks at me and he's like, right, you've got 10 minutes, 10 minutes teapot time, and then that's it. That's all you're getting. Right. <laughs> so I've got a little quota. Yeah. yeah, it's hard though. It's hard for other people, isn't it? Because if, if someone has never done something like that, they, they can't. I don't think people can really comprehend what it's like to to live on your bike. You know, in, no. in, in a totally different country, a totally different culture. It's I, there's nothing like it. There's no other form for me. There's no other form of travel that I've done that that I can compare it to. I, I've not done the whole backpacking. Obviously, I've never cycled, um, you know, on a, on overland or anything like that. But. <laughs> I don't know if people will react to you the same if you're backpacking or if you're cycling. Like you said, on a motorbike, it's no. it's got this whole different element to it. Yeah, you love it, you love it or hate it, you can't help but notice a motorbike. Absolutely, um, yeah. Whereas, as you say, you're a backpacker, you're just you're a backpacker, you know, that's mm-hmm. fine, but you, you walk around the place. If you're in a car, 
nobody wants to talk to you because there's a window between you. Yeah, barrier. Yeah. Uh, there's a, just a distinct barrier, and everybody's got a car. But if you're in, especially in third world countries, uh, big spikes. A lot of people have motorbikes, but they're all one two fives, and mm-hmm. that sort of thing. They're skidding about scooters, and um, whenever you see in a, a seven fifty or eight fifty, whatever it is, uh, you you do stand out, and it, it's not really, that you're trying to be better than anybody else, but by being noticed, you haven't got time, you haven't got time to stay in a village for a week or a month and get to know everybody. You've got a couple of days. You want to experience what's going on, so you want to mm. be able to notice you and make talk to people. Now you don't want to be have to wait until Saturday night before everybody's in the pub, yeah, or whatever it is. So it's a great way of instantaneously getting. Well, it sounds wrong to say they get attention, but they get say hi guys, how you doing? I'm mm. you here? Can you show me around? You know? Yeah, yeah. And isn't it? I I, I found it initially really quite shocking. Is the wrong word, but it took me back. It took me aback how open and generous complete strangers were to me, like, all all around the world. Mm-hmm. Basically, maybe maybe I change. Maybe I drop my guard once I'm on the road. I don't know, but but just almost everybody you you, you meet to a man. They open up their lives to you. You know, it's just like, well, yeah. okay, where, where are you sleeping? Come, come and stay here. Have you eaten? Do you, do you want some? Please come and have some food. And it's almost like they're insulted if if you don't take them up on their hospitality. Uh, and and it's uh, it, it sort of struck me, and I thought, would would I do the same? You know, would I do the same here in the UK if I met a traveller? Yeah. And I don't think I would have until I travelled. Now I, I try to, much to the annoyance of my wife. Weird, yeah. but, yeah. yeah, but now I try to, but it's 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 hard though, isn't it? In in yeah, the well, Western well, world, always bring strange people, bring strange people <laughs> home with you, are you? Yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> I have, I have done it, but uh, yeah, or like uh, people I've met, people I met when I was traveling. You know, you get a message from them going, "I'm I'm going to be in the UK," so I'm just like, "Yeah, come, I'll return the favor, yeah. come and stay at mine." And my message is like, "Who who is this?" <laughs> <laughs> I think people, I think the reason for it is a couple of reasons. I think one of the reasons is people are much better than everybody says bad impressions of horrible people around the world, but people are yeah. generally fairly good uh, against all what you're told, especially in countries that you don't think we are going to be, apart from West mm. Africa, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I do you think, so I've thought about quite a lot of my travels, and I think part of it is people feel a bond with you because they realize that you're traveling around the world, you're going somewhere and they want to do that themselves. Yeah. And by helping yeah. you, they're sort of, they, they feel like contributing to doing it and it gives them a buzz as well. That they're part of your journey, if you like. Yeah, absolutely. So I think people do, they do actually feel better by giving you that help. Mm. Um, I think they appreciate how vulnerable you maybe are as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if you know how the format of the podcast works, Chris. I, I post up on, on my Patreon and on my socials to say who the next guest is, and people have the opportunity to leave um, like questions or comments, and, and we then go through them and you know hopefully answer their question. But also, it can be a topic for discussion as we go. How long do you yeah. have? I should have asked you this at the start. Well, I'm about halfway through my beer, so I'm okay. <laughs> right. Oh, okay, okay. I'll not, I'll not, I'll not keep you all night. Um, are you okay? <laughs> if we just crack on with some questions now, then, and just see yeah, where no, it takes us. Yeah, all good. I've got all night. Sorry, Bob. What was that? Plenty. I've got, I've got all night. Plenty of time. Beautiful, lovely job. Okay then, folks. Right. Well, as always, we'll head across to the clan over on Patreons, patreon.com forward slash t put one. First question, uh, Andy. Hi both, just wanted to say thanks for the book recommendation. I'll use it on my holiday to catch up, so may find the answer to my question then. But just in case, what was behind the need to complete this trip? Straight in there. Well, I didn't complete the trip, I suppose, as a question. I ended up in Argentina. But, but you I have since, though. I have since, yeah. Well, once I got the book out um, three years ago, one of my mates, Liam, is another motorguzzy biker. He said to me, "Well, you never actually got this trail. Why not have another go?" This is just in the middle of COVID, obviously. Mm-hmm. So I thought, "Well, I'm going to do that. I've got to do it on the same bike." I was lucky enough to kept the bike over the years. So, um, again, problem solving. With all, oh, well, I've got a wife, family, work commitments. I can't just disappear for three months, let alone a year and a half. So, 
did a plan we'd, we'd do it in legs we'd go do two week like two week driving park the bikes up somewhere come back home go back to work for two or three months and then go back out again and do it uh-huh. over a period of about a year so we left November 2001 got down to Athens I don't know if I'm answering this question or not <laughs> come with a very long answer that's um, right no worries and then uh, parked up in Athens with, with the mother the guys there Took the next trip two months later, got to Israel, which I'd been to before. Um, and before I couldn't get out of Israel through Egypt or Jordan, this time they wouldn't let me into Jordan as well. So I had to go back to Athens again. So it was a bit deja vu there. <laughs> um, the idea was to go through from from Israel into Jordan and then into Saudi to do, uh-huh. through to Dubai that way. So I uh, came back to D- Athens, uh, Liam. For various reasons, we're going to now decide to come home. We gave up the trip, so left me on my own, which is a bit of a pain in the ass because it was his idea in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> so I then had to decide, well, am I going to go on or not? So, of course, being a stubborn get, decided well, I'm going to go on. I've started, I'm not going to stop. So uh, next leg was from Athens to Dubai, through uh-huh. Greece, Turkey and Iran. Finally got past the American Embassy in Iran, in Tehran. Uh, and then the next day after that was Dubai to Lahore in Pakistan, which is an interesting trip as well. And then last March, um, after that was Lahore to Nepal, and then I flew back from Nepal to Brisbane. Mm. So I finally got there in 2003, 43 years after I left. How did that feel? So it's going to be the... The longest ever trip to Australia. <laughs> How and did I, it feel to, to to get to Sydney? I felt great. I mean, one of the reasons, I suppose, part of us finally completed the trip, as you say, but that's all sort of in the mind in a wee bit, in a way. But it was such a great welcome I got in Australia. It was fantastic. It was really good. Uh, great to be there. Great to get there the way I got there to finally complete the trip with us. I in 1979. Yeah, um, and I met a couple of guys through the trip, through the book, and through the trip that I actually met. I mean, one of the guys I stayed with in Israel, I'd stayed with when we were forty three years ago. Hadn't spoken to him since. Wow. Tracked him down through the benefits through Facebook. But met up for a beer and chatted about old times forty three years ago. Wow! Uh, so it was pretty amazing. Lots of other amazing trips, bits about the trip in a way. But I suppose one of the that's why the destination, actually getting there is actually, I find a bit disappointing. So how do you feel when you got there? I actually feel disappointed mm. whenever it gets somewhere like that because it's the end of the journey. Yeah. I was going to say, it's like, did, did it feel like, did it feel like a final big tick, right? I've done it now. Or is it, I, I, I've never hidden the fact. I, I really struggled when I finished my trip, when I got home. It took me a good eight, eight months, maybe more. To sort of settle into life back home, yeah. It, I just, I don't know. It just, it just felt. It didn't feel like home anymore. It, it, I, I was different. I'd totally changed, but but life at home and everyone I knew hadn't. You know, everyone's moaning about yeah. the same shit they were moaning about before you left. And I, I came back feeling really frustrated. Like I wanted to grab people and like slap them and shake them and go. If you don't fucking like it, change it. Do something about it. You know. Yeah. Like, yeah, get, get it's up to you, but, yeah. But uh, before yeah. you know it, I, I, eventually I just fell back into the old way of things, really, and sort of took, well, it, took to, a while. Yeah, yeah. You know, if you you can't change what's going on at home, it's, it's the way life, it's the way civilization is. You've got to either fit in with it or get out of it. You know, and mm. that's why some people do drop out. I guess. Yeah. If you got to get on, you realize at that stage, if you're going to get on in life, you got to fit in. You got to conform to some extent. Otherwise, you're just going to be banging your head against the brick wall, you know? Yeah, no, true, true. But uh, it's, you know, so it's, arriving in Australia was, so was a bit disappointing in a way because it was the end of the journey. And the first thing you think about is, well, what am I going to do next? Yeah. Which I'm actually still thinking about. <laughs> <laughs> What's the itch? Is, is there an itch that needs to be scratched? There's a big itch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go well, on. I've got to get the bike home. The bike's, bike's still in Australia. Really? So hence there's a problem. Yeah, it's in a museum and uh, it's a Mudagazi museum. It's called the Mudagazi Cathedral. There's a guy called Leo Tamers. Um, 
as a, a, a farmer out there and he's converted his barn into a multi museum in the last hundred years worth of multi Wow. So he's just caretaking the bike at the minute. It's having a rest. Well, it's deserved it, isn't it? It's has deserved it. How many miles on or now? It's about 75,000 or so. Not that, not that many, really, but the fact that it's been a hard paper, paper round for it. It's been a hard 75,000 miles, though, isn't it? You know, it East, yeah. East Africa <laughs> in, the, <laughs> in, the, in the 80, well, 1980, bloody hell. Um, is this latest uh, section, so from home to Sydney, is that going to be another book? Yeah, well, I've started writing that. Brilliant. But my, um, I, said, I have a very good record taking after taking 43 years to write the first book. I've <laughs> pretty good record of writing books, but hopefully it'll be a bit quicker this time. <laughs> well, the first book was, it was very much, the first journey was very much a sort of coming of age story. And yeah. um, I've had quite a few non bikers have read it and really enjoyed it, which has been nice because I've tried to make it not a motorbike trip. Because in a way, it wasn't a motorbike trip. The motorbike was just a means of travel. Yeah. Um, and that's obviously a big part of the trip because it's a means of travel. But the journey is more about who you meet, where you are, how that affected yourself, and how you get on with things. So it's, it's, it was looking back, I didn't realize it at the time, but it was very much a coming of age story. Mm. Um, this book's more of a, well, it titled them as Adventure Before Dementia. Which is the other end of the the life cycle, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. So hopefully, um, I haven't left it too late. <laughs> I look forward to reading that. Absolutely, it sounds like it's um, yeah, sounds like there's uh, there's going to be a lot to 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 chat about on that one. Uh, Andy's got a second question. He says, final question to you both. Having completed it, how do you address the post trip blues? Well, we just sort of chatted about that. Um, yeah, like how how did you deal with that coming back? And settling back into life in the eighties, you mean? Yeah, uh, it was it was pretty tough, as you say. I was really quite depressed at the time, and I was suffering from a cut hepatitis in South America, mm. so I wasn't feeling great either. Um, uh, so I mean, we, we can't a... we can't scar over that, Chris. You you pretty much almost died. You were literally at death's door, were you not? Well, I couldn't ride my motorbike, so I suppose that's near as possible <laughs> step to where it is. <laughs> if you can't ride a motorbike, there's not much else left. <laughs> so it's pretty grim. Uh, again, it's one thing being sick when you're at home, but another thing being sick when you've no money oh, yeah. and stuck in some shithole like Bolivia. Yeah. yeah, it's a different story altogether. Um, so it's pretty tough, tough going getting back to, uh, to civilization. But I think I'm a pretty lucky guy. The coins landed the right way up and it got got okay, got got the bottom okay, you know. So coming back, how how did you deal with that? I think I just had to I realized that after a couple of months my health got better. I realized as you said that it wasn't things were different, things hadn't moved on, I changed and other things hadn't. Mm. And I just sort of focused my life to push my head to say I'm gonna have to bang on it here regardless. Bought an old house and put my energies into fixing that up. I wanted something stable, something, something that didn't move to focus on. Yeah. Um, the bike got parked in the garage and got forgotten about for quite a few years. So I had to make a determined decision to say, this is what I'm going to do. I'm not going to sit around mostly sort of fuzzy things going on in my head. I'm going to direct my intentions into focusing on one thing and getting, getting life sorted, you know. Yeah. And as you say, just fitting in with the groove. Mm-hmm. I found like setting myself, set myself goals, sites, little challenges, because I'd, you know, I'd, I'd spent a couple of years before my trip constantly planning the trip, and that was the end goal was to go on the trip, and then once you're on the trip, the end goal is to make it happen, isn't it? It's just it's to find fuel, yeah, it's to yeah. find food, it's to find somewhere to stay, and make make the trip work. So once I was home, it it was like I need I I needed something to 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 fix my my mind on you know to to give myself yeah. goals so i just remember having but, like umpteen just a, an idea would pop in your head and you'd be like yeah let's go for that and i'd just throw everything at that so like, right, yeah. okay, that's not gonna work next one <laughs> no and i think that's part of the disappointment once you get to where you were going to once you get to yeah. sydney you think well what am i gonna do now you know mm. um 
and you spent the last year, several years planning for the moment of arriving in Sydney, and all of a sudden you're there, and there's no future for you because you've done what you intended to oh, do. Yeah, yeah. Now what? So it's yeah. now what? You know. Um, so this time last year, I got to Sydney. I was happy enough because I had other. I, I kind of I knew what the feeling was, and I knew how to address it. And what you do when you finish one journey is plan the next. <laughs> basically, yeah. So absolutely. I suppose that's probably the that's probably the answer to the question: is you finish on once you get to the destination, you plan your next journey. That's it. Yeah, yeah. Set your sights on the next thing. Yeah. Right. Cheers for that, Andy. Thank you very much for your questions, pal. Next one, Charlie Callard. Evening, gents. Hope you both fit in well. Well, this looks like a, this looks an epic adventure with a hell of a story. I'll definitely be getting the audio book soon. So my questions to you both. On your darkest of days of travel, what was the inspiration or drive to keep going? Staying alive. Yeah. Yeah, you Staying you had alive. a whole different level than me. <laughs> I thought I had a few dodgy <laughs> moments, but reading your book, gee whiz. I mean, you, you kind of... No. You seem to have yeah, umpteen just... different civil wars and just loads of issues coming down through Africa. It just seemed to be an incredibly volatile experience. Well, the beauty about the trip was that if I'd planned to go down through Africa, I wouldn't have done it yeah. because it was impossible <laughs> in paper to do. Yeah. Uh, you know, Uganda was in civil war. Sudan was in civil war. The Kenya-Tanzania border was closed. Zambia was dodgy. Rhodesia was in civil war. Australia, or South Africa was had apartheid. So you just only a madman would have decided to do it. <laughs> the only reason I did it was I didn't know any better. <laughs> Stupidity gets you through a lot sometimes. Oh, again, folks, we, we can't go. I just we can't cover it in this podcast. You're gonna have to read the book or listen to it. It's it's boggling. They're gonna make a film about it's... this one day, mate. They will make a film about it, and people will watch it and go, "That's too far fetched." Bollocks! That never happened. <laughs> oh, <there's... laughs> Yeah, so for you, just pure survival, that was the drive. Pretty much. Um, I think you get you get stuck in this place. You know that there's nobody else that's going to get you out of there but yourself, so you got to get yourself out of it. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, you live in the UK, if, you, if your car breaks down, you call the AA, you ring a friend, or the police come by and give you help, whatever, you yeah. know, you don't. But you, you get, your wheel falls off in Africa. you got to get it sorted. You got to deal with That's it. it, yeah. Got to deal yeah with absolutely, it. especially then because you didn't have. I remember, I remember when it was going a bit wrong in in Mauritania, and um, I, I, like I, I really struggled to get any supplies from the locals. They, they seemed to hate me for some reason, and I can only put it down to, I, I, I did my trip on a. You find out a lot of it. Really. <laughs> yeah, everyone's yeah, everyone's like that. Um, yeah, I, I did it on a, a Suzuki GSXR thousand, and my bike was yeah. was covered in like uh, company logos. I mean, I, I wasn't I, I wasn't like a massive sponsored trip, but companies paid like a hundred quid to get their logo put on the bike, and that's that's nice. part how I how I, I funded it. Um, and I was doing it in leathers as well, and some of my leathers had some patches on them as well. You know, like a like a race suit. Yeah. And I kind of think it was only the only time I experienced any negativity was Mauritania. And I, I can only put it down to it was the bike and what I looked like. It uh, it seemed to invoke a really negative reaction from people. It's like shop shop owners wouldn't sell me water. They wouldn't sh sell me bread. So like I was going into the Sahara with no no water and no food. So obviously, the literally the first day, I snapped the subframe and um, I ended up just like in a heap in the desert in my leather suit cooking. And I, I pretty much think I wouldn't have survived that if it wasn't for this old boy, South African guy, was riding a Euro, you know, a, a sidecar unit. He was yeah. riding his, his Euro from, he'd just divorced his wife. So he was riding from Scotland back to, I think, Cape Town, actually, in South Africa, because he'd always wanted to do it. So he thought, oh, fuck it, I can do it now. So he happened to be just coming behind me, and he he pulled up behind me and literally kicked me in the arse and told me to get up and get on the bike. And mm -hmm. I buddied with him through Mauritania from then. And we'd see that when we went to shops, people were all smiles and would serve him no problem. And with me, people were throwing their sandals at me. <laughs> and he was like, well, that's, that's a really <laughs> weird reaction. <laughs> But um, what, what was my point on no. that? 
I can't remember what my point was. But I will. It was a personal, personal, personal problem. I was <laughs> yeah, yeah. I wasn't, I wasn't welcome in Mauritania for some reason. <laughs> I think. I mean, I have heard of various travelers having more trouble in West Africa than East Africa, which I would put down to maybe the language. A lot of French, mm. you get French and Spanish, so mm. it's more difficult to communicate with the locals there. Yeah. Whereas in East Africa, it's more of the old British colonies. So British is uh, British. English is more of the language of, of choice. Most people speak a bit of English. So right. I think it's easier to communicate with people no matter what level they're at. Mm. Um, I think and, that's like, possibly part of it. And, and I, I, I was a, I, I'm a former policeman, believe it or not, in, in London. And um, we get taught about, you know, uh, conflict resolution and that your action affects their reaction, which affects your action. Mm -hmm. And I remember... I, I really do think it was because I was probably so on edge, like my threat assessments through the roof when I went into, you know, when you go into Mauritania, literally through the border, you're after the first, I think it's customs. After that, you've got like a kilometre of desert to get through to get to the, the police bit mm. of, the, of the border before you're you're in. And that's, it's a minefield. It's a it's an open minefield with a couple of tracks through it. And um, I ended up stuck in a minefield at one point. Literally, that's, that's you, you're in Mauritania. That's your first reaction to it. So from then on, I was just literally wired. And I think that probably, mm. well, it definitely had a detrimental effect because I'm straight away, I'm, yeah, I'm up to here when I'm meeting people and yeah. dealing with people. And that's only going to have a negative impact, isn't it? So I think it's, it irks me to to have been beaten. So, you know, we were chatting I think about possibly what's... been been brought up in Northern Ireland in the seventies. Yeah, probably gave me a bit of a heads up on dealing with getting in and out of conflict situations, being That's the wrong place at the wrong time, yeah. and uh, knowing this guy doesn't like me. How can I get him to like me? Mm -hmm. How can I get myself out of this situation which could go wrong? You can get the the vibe. This is not a good situation. Yeah. How can we? Direct us in a in a better better direction, you know. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that probably gave me a bit of a a, a start, head start in that, and yeah. maybe not been so I don't know, sort of paranoid or yeah. If you're if people sense you're scared, it's not a good thing, you know. They if they're aggressive, they'll feed on it. If they're not aggressive, they'll just try and rip you off, whatever it is. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's important to try and look brave but not be cocky, even if you're shitting yourself, you know. Yeah. I, I remember, like, for me, I would never change how things went in West Africa because when I got the option to restart the trip and go again, it gave me a completely different mindset to it all in that, you know, no matter what happens, I'm doing this. You know, whether I'm dragging the bike back, carrying the bike back, or we're both coming back in a box, we're going to do this. We're, we're just going to keep going. And my, I, I think I was just, as you just said, I was so much more open to anything and everyone. I, I, mm -hmm. I don't, I don't ever remember having that same feeling of, of threat and impending doom. Like I had coming into Mauritania. I just didn't have that for the rest of the trip. It was just like, right. Okay. We'll just see what, what happens today? What's going to happen in the next hour? And that hundred well, percent. Once you once you have attitude. that once you have that once you have that heavy duty antagonism against you. Yeah. You, you, I think that's that's not is not important after that. You know, you, yeah, that's yeah. your that's your level of I can cope with that. So I think that's yeah. not as, oh guy's got a gun. Who gives a shit? You know. Yeah. yeah. Put that away. Stop being silly. You know. <laughs> Which sounds ridiculous, but that is what it's like, isn't it? It's just like oh well, that's yeah. just what they do. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Stop giving me a hard time, you know? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Charlie says, on the flip side, what's been your highest or favourite moment from your travels? And it doesn't need to be just that one trip, like from all your travels. What's been your, your like, top moment? Um, don't think I can say that over on air, can I? <laughs> <laughs> I won't tell if you want. <laughs> um, well, so many, so many ups and downs. Um Getting in South Africa, I really enjoyed South Africa. Get, not just arriving in South Africa so much as being there because it's a beautiful country and having mm. got there over land uh, when the country was pretty much closed off to Western Westerners and Africa generally, it was you know it was very hard to get to, very isolated. I got a great reaction there, so I really enjoyed that. And probably similar in Australia as well. More recently, mm. we got such a 
people who realize appreciate you having made such a big effort to get to their country. Yeah. They're very welcoming and and uh give you a good time, you know. So probably those two moments, I suppose, not so much a destination, but just enjoying the being being in the, the countries that have arrived in. Yeah. But there's so many ups and downs. I'd say Absolutely. Well, that. I think I, I remember I remember getting to um Vladivostok in, in eastern Russia and and just thinking Oh, I've you know you're feeling like I've I've actually accomplished something. You know, when you're crossing mm. Russia, it's all road. It was all road that I did yeah. there. Well, where there, you know, they have little sections where there's, it's like trail riding. But um, yeah, I remember just thinking, I can do this. Like, yeah, okay, right, I've done I've I've done something out the norm now. Russia tech, yeah. bring it on, and then like working way down through Southeast Asia, getting to to Delhi. I remember getting to Delhi and just thinking. Yeah, I think I can do this now. You know, like we're all you yeah. do Delhi, you ship to Australia, then across to South America, and you're like, right, okay, yeah, we'll bring it on. Let's just deal with it. What's happening? What's next? Give me another problem. Yeah, yeah, aye, yeah. yeah. But as you as you said, you know, like I think once you've once you've dealt with what is the worst thing that's happened to you so far, well, you're that that's now your your gauge, isn't it? It's like, well, if it, if it doesn't yeah. get anywhere near that. Okay, I can deal with this. No problem. That's average, so, you know. I think, yeah, I think, yeah, I think, yeah. I think, I think, I think it's up to that's not not bad. I think, but worse than that is bad, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it does, absolutely. Which is quite dangerous as well because you do get you can get a bit uh, complacent away with yourself. Yeah, like, yeah. Uh, complacent. You say, I can do it. I can survive it. People yeah, point yeah. guns at me. I don't give a shit. You know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But uh, no, you can't get a bit coffee on it. Yeah. Uh, Charlie, cheers for those questions, mate. Top questions. Next one, David McCracken. Hi, Chris. What a pleasure to be able to ask you some thought-provoking questions. Oops. Uh, one, Oops. Was, your, was your trip driven by the urge to travel or an urge to get away from Belfast during what was undoubtedly a difficult time for our city? Uh, both. Both. Mm. Although not so much to get away because when you're brought up in a country, you're brought up in a city, you don't know anything better. You know, you don't know anything. It was uh, like, maybe like we were talking before. My life in Belfast was average. It was the way normal was. Yeah. So there was bombs going off and people getting shot, whatever. So a teenager in Belfast, I'd, I'd seen things in TV, and obviously you wasn't like that everywhere, but that was my average. Mm -hmm. So I suppose I was lucky. I was a brother of some middle class family, wasn't it? Didn't sort of suffer the uh, father's business got blown up several times, lost a few friends. I was going to really cover that, there. yeah wasn't that bad. I didn't really have a hard time compared to most, so it wasn't a big deal, but it was sort of pretty average. But I did want to, it was more to get away and see what's going else on else in the world, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, you're, 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 you're just sort of, in a blase fashion, my father's business got blown up a few times. I mean, it was, was it like three times it got, it got blown up? Oh, dozens of times, to be honest, over the years. Dozens? Uh, Jeez. Probably. Well, the IRA had seemed to have this thing against furniture shops. I don't know whether it was G Plan or Parker Knoll, whatever they didn't like, but it seemed to blow up furniture shops with great frequency, I think, because it burned quite well in those days. Yeah, I suppose so. It yeah. seemed to be a favorite target. <laughs> God. <laughs> but yeah. I mean, well, oh, geez. Uh, I mean, I'm aware of the troubles, but obviously, I the only experience I ever had of the troubles was was the TV growing up. You know, I was born '76, yeah. so you know I was aware it was going on, and obviously, I saw the, the the bombs going off in in London on the TV. But then, as a as a as a copper coming into London, it, that the threat had pretty much passed by the time I was down here, so 2002 when I joined. Yeah, and but then we got we got the other end of it, so 2005 when. Um, uh, Al Qaeda, you know, detonated the bombs on the tube and everything. It was like, well, hang on it a minute. Took over, yeah. <laughs> it's all got very real all of a sudden here. So yeah, it was sort of. Uh, thankfully, I never got, I never got caught up in any explosions. But you know, uh, it was one of my mates was the copper that got stabbed at uh, Westminster, and ended up the stabbings uh, on London Bridge. I ended up working on that as well. So you know, you, you do experience it, but I can't imagine. Every, yeah, I can't imagine. There that being your day-to-day -day life, you know, in, in the troubles, with it actually well, impacting really, on your life? It's probably easy, easier as a day-to-day life, as I say, because we didn't know any better, because that was just mm. normal life. Um, mm. If I lived somewhere else, I came there first. 
practice. I remember taking my daughter to the museum and seeing the museum had a big exhibit about the troubles. And I thought, Jesus, I'm in the museum already, you know? Yeah, yeah. That was a few <laughs> years back. Yeah. Um, and certainly now you see movies like Belfast and um, 71. There's a movie on Netflix the other day. But about the troubles, you realize it was a pretty shitty time to be about. Mm. And our school was in the middle of Belfast. So we did. I mean, I would be horrified sending my daughter into a school like that. Yeah. Now, it was my parents didn't like me that much or something. It just seemed to be a horrible thing to do to send your kids in the middle of a war zone to go to school, you know? <laughs> it's crazy to think four, of it like that. They had, four, it... they had four of us. They could afford to lose a couple of them, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> a couple of spares, as Prince Harry says, you know? But, uh, it just seemed to be more, more acceptable or whatever. It's just what we did, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting that because it that undoubtedly that undoubtedly undoubtedly helped you deal with what happened on the on the trip. Then, as you said, because your 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 gauge is already at a totally different level. Your normal is already out with most people's normal. Yeah, it? my my danger my danger gauge as I call Aye. it was, was quite so high up compared to most yeah. people anyway. Yeah. Uh, you know, the arm checkpoints to people putting guns at you it didn't really bother yeah. me too much because I had done in Belfast and knew that the guys behind the guns were just kids themselves, you know, they mm. don't really want to kill you, they just want to yeah. do their job and whatever, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Generally. <laughs> you always have to chuck that in, don't you? Generally, because you do get the odd <laughs> wrong in it, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Everywhere. Um, David also says, question two, what is best, red tato or yellow tato? What's this? Is this some sort of sauce? What's red tato or yellow tato? Tato crisps, I presume. Oh, they... Tato, typically, oh, which is basically a golden wonder. You English people have golden wonder, which obviously aren't anything. It's like our potato crisps. <laughs> and yellow is the best because that's cheese and onion. <laughs> right. Oh, okay, got you. So wait, yellow is the best, is it? Cheese and onion. Yeah. He says, uh, last one, do you follow... One. Uh, yeah, there's plenty of them. Do you follow the Irish road racing scene? If so, which event do you most enjoy? Uh, probably make myself a bit, a bit unpopular by saying the last road race I went to see was the Northwest. We used to enjoy going up to it, riding up the coast and having a great blast when we were kids. Yeah. Um, but I remember, I think it was Tommy Heron got killed. He was the top rider at that stage because he yeah. just something went wrong with the bike and hit a lamppost I just thought this is crazy it's a crazy sport mm. and I never went back again to be honest wow. I just think um, the road racing has grown the bikes have grown out of road racing um, one of the guys I met when I got home from South America it was uh, or got home from Africa actually was uh, Stanley Woods if you remember was a big Norton racer back before, before the war Right. And he rode motor guzzies as well in the afternoon with him. And he'd got a couple of fingers missing. He was pretty beat up. He was about in his 80s. But he was riding the races when they were going up sort of 80 miles an hour on the same mm. roads that they're doing 180 miles an hour. And I just, I just yeah. think it's a bit crazy, to be honest. But that's just I, me. I hate to I, see them stop. I think yeah. it's a great tradition and all the rest of it. I love it. But I just think for young guys to be hurling themselves around those roads with speeds, it's just crazy. I, I kind of, I, I agree. I do agree, but I also think if if people want to do that, who who is anyone else to tell them they can't do it? You know, I'm I'm kind of mm -hmm. I'm very much in that mindset. Everybody involved knows the risks, and they still choose to do it. So if the option is there to do it, it should never be taken away. I don't I don't think you you, you can't you can't teenage boys people. teenage boys True. teenage boys and boys in their twenties. Are incredibly stupid when it comes to not true. Like that, yeah, yeah, as true. you and I remember. Yeah, but if you stop <laughs> them road racing, I'm sure they'll find someone else to do, won't they? Speaking as a saddle get yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I hate to say it's stopping. The Ulster Grand Prix looks like it's it stopped at COVID and it doesn't. Mm. It's never got started again. Yeah, that's terribly yeah. sad. You know, it's a great tradition. I love the little razzmatazz of it, but I just think that the when the race started on the bikes they had. They were basically like go-karts compared to what they're riding mm. now, you know? Mm. That's 200 odd mile an hour now, isn't it? Insane. Yeah. Crazy. Totally. I, me I remember experiencing the, the Isle of Man TT for the first time. And I, like I, 
I love my speed on a bike and it never it never there was no negativity about about speed or about like the road race and I couldn't wait to experience it but I remember yeah. standing at the bottom of Bray Hill and the bikes came by and they're doing about 180 odd when they go by there at the bottom of Bray Hill and they almost lift the manhole cover you know as they go by this pressure wave yeah, hits you yeah. and I just yeah. I just remember thinking to myself if they crash they're dead and they're not just dead they're missed yeah. it's like and and that feeling hit me and I was just like Oh God, I don't, I don't want to witness that. I don't want to see that. You know, like yeah. I've seen road accidents. I don't, I don't want to have this in front of me. And it did, it, no. it changed, not, not in a, not in a negative way, because I still love watching road racing, and I, I don't think it should be stopped. But it did change my attitude towards it. It was like, fuck, they're not, they're not fucking about here. This isn't playtime. This is, this is proper. This no. is like life or death if you get this wrong. And I hadn't really comprehended I was, that. I don't think yeah. before. And I think before, when I watched the road races, before the people were getting killed and whatever, but whatever, Tommy Aaron, who was the top mm. guy mm. at that time, died, I thought, well, if he can't do it, they yeah. getting killed, who can, you know? And the Dunlops are the same, you know? Yeah. They still have yeah. it. You know, suffered so much. A little yeah. bit top of, the, top of the game, but they're still yeah. getting killed. I, which, I went to um, where, um, Esto is it Estonia, where Joey came off? Estonia, yeah, yeah. I, I, I I went I, I went to pay my respects and it doesn't even look like a corner. It's I, you, I remember looking at it and thinking how how has anyone crashed here? Let alone like the best road racer on the planet at the time. And you just think it's almost like one of those things that comes into your head where you go, do you know when your time's there, your time's there. It's it's gonna get you. Yeah. What, you know when 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 that clock ticks and it's your time. You know, yeah. I, just, I, I, I can't concentration comprehend or whatever it was. You know. Yeah. yeah. Yes, how? No, it's not a, not a lack of skill to get around that corner. It was just something obtuse, like a lack of concentration yeah. or something in the road or whatever. Something yeah. silly just happened. But that was the end of his life sort of thing, you know? So, yeah. So, as not, you say, it's another topic of conversation at all together, isn't it? It, it is, yeah. And, and I was going to I was going to ask, tell me, tell me if you're not interested, but, like, do you believe in fate? Because, like, you know, on, on your trip... I remember on my trip, there seemed to just be things will go wrong, things will go wrong, things will go wrong. And just at the point where you thought, I'm foobarred, like, I'm done. This is it. I, I can't see a way out of, you know, if it's a your breakdown or whatever it is, someone seems to turn up, something seems to happen. And, you know, next thing you know, that's a, it's a lift in your spirits and you're moving again. Some, something happens, just something yeah. happens to keep it going. Do you believe in fate? No, I believe it. You'll make it happen. Generally, yeah, yeah. Uh, you'll make it happen if you try and make it happen. It'll happen. I'm not very religious. I think um, certainly the, the luck has a a lot to do with it. You, you can be lucky and not lucky. Things will happen. It won't mm -hmm. happen. But generally, I think you'll make it happen yourself. Yeah. And I think if you have a positive attitude that you're going to make it happen, there's more chance it will happen. That's true. Yeah. yeah maybe that. Maybe that is fate. I don't know. If you, but you're making it you're generating the positive waves to make it happen and then by the luck by the statistics whatever something will come right you know yeah something's yeah. gone wrong to put you in that position in the first place I, I suppose it's like what we spoke about it. like what we spoke about earlier you know you just don't give up do you because it's it's not yeah. over if you don't give up it's only over yeah when you give up, I suppose. So well, you yeah, can't give up so. because you're stuck in the middle of nowhere. You can't give yeah. up. You, you've, you've got, got no option, do you? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, you're going to stay there the rest of your yeah. life. You know, but then, gonna... sorry, go on, go on. Well, I think, uh, as I say, in the West, in the sort of civilized world, you can give up, and somebody will take it over for you and look after you and yeah. take you to the hospital or sort you out. You know, there's always something. There's always a backup plan. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're the West, the third world countries where there's no backup plan, it's just yourself. You just got to sort yeah. it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And even more so when you did it, because there was no such thing as the internet. There's no such thing as mobiles. No. Um, whereas, you know, even when I did it, I, I had a mobile on me at all times. And even if I had no signal, you wouldn't need to go too far into society to find yeah. somewhere that would have Wi Fi, you know, and yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely easier now for sure. Uh, right. Next one, Patrick Collum. Hello and happy new year to you both. Apologies, it's just getting back in. Oh, that's all he's saying. Sorry, Patrick. He's just saying he's getting back into the swing of, of the year. 
All right. Hi, how you doing, Patrick? All right. Uh, last one on Patreon. You're getting a what? Hi, guys. Chris, I loved your book. Do you still have the Le Mans? Well, yes. It's in Sydney, isn't it? <laughs> Melbourne, yeah. Oh, Melbourne. Sorry. <laughs> right. It's probably yeah. a year off. Uh, he says, do you think it would be possible to complete your journey today with the same level of planning and resourcing, resources or lack of? Interesting. I think it's easier in a way to do it with the same level of lack of resources. Um, is the world a more peaceful place than it was before? Some things haven't changed. Israel hasn't changed. The Middle East hasn't changed that much. Mm -hmm. Africa's, Africa's certainly got a lot easier. Um, the roads are easier. I think there's a, there's a road across most of the Sahara now. Yeah. Um, the Chinese are building railways. It's, Africa's certainly a lot more civilized. Uh, I was there. It was just coming out of the post-colonial collapse of society, basically. In those days, you know, dictators had started and draining all the money. They're still doing that in a lot of places in Africa, but certainly a lot more civilized now. Um, well, I suppose the answer is I, I did it. I just did it last year over six months over the mm -hmm. over the two well, sorry, over the two years on the same bike. So it was a pretty close uh, sort of similar comparison between the two trips, although they were different areas of the world. Yeah, and Asia is a lot easier than Africa in those days. I don't know. It's still it's still up to yourself on how much you can. You, you still the individual problems are going to occur mm -hmm. with borders, with meeting people, getting robbed, getting running out of gas, whatever it is. The same, a lot of the same problems are still there. But some things have got easier. The internet certainly made life a lot easier, and more pleasant, and taking a lot of the magic away from it, away with away. I suppose in the, I you, you've got a way out, don't you? There's there's a much yeah. more readily accessible way out or or source yeah. of help. Yeah. And you could, of course, decide to do the trip without your mobile phone, without your GPS and all the rest, but that would just wow. be really stupid. <laughs> Imagine what that would be you like know. today, though. You know, if you if you didn't have a phone with you, if you just went old school, like a paper I was thinking about map. that at the time, and it just would be nuts, because it would be, as I say, there's a road across the Sahara now through Sudan, the little Sudan, and it would be a wee bit, say, like saying, I'm going to drive this across the sand, even though the road's over there. Yeah. I'm yeah. going to do the trip across the sand. It's going to take me a week instead of five hours, you know? Yeah. It would just be, you'd only be, be pretending to be good to be doing it. So you'd be doing a Top Gear journey, you know, where yeah. Clarkson does his journeys with the three of them are crossing the desert, whatever it is, when it actually yeah. there's 24 cameramen and everybody else standing beside them. <laughs> so I've, I've actually. That. I've got Charlie Borman on here in a couple of weeks, actually. Yeah, so that's uh -huh. that's going to be interesting. I'm sure there's going to be quite a few questions from people around that. <laughs> Don't mention uh, my name. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I mean, you else? do what you can, and uh, with more respect to them. They did a, they did a well, you're, you're a film star, you you and McGregor. Yeah. You've got to take all those uh, precautions and everything else and design your trip for your your own sensibility, your own person. Uh, absolutely. You know? And they were creating a TV show around that trip. Yeah. And what, what I say to people is without without them doing that, despite the fact, you know, you and and like Ted Simon and Elspeth Beard and, and Jackie and, and all these other people, uh, Simon and Lisa, all these amazing people have, have done and continue to do these stunning trips. Despite that, the vast majority of people out there only know about overland motorcycle travel because yeah. of long way around yeah. it brought it to the forefront yeah. it's i didn't know about any of you guys i didn't know about ted simon until i saw long way around and it was long way around that lit the fire for me to go i want to do that mm -hmm. that's what i want to do and, and then and i found out about, yeah 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 it's been great that they've done that because they've been able to make it a, a pub, raise the public awareness of it you know mm. one of the lovely things about my journey um Two years ago, when it started, I met a girl called Leo. Well, an old lady, she was called uh, Mary Cyber, who had ridden around the world on a BSA Bantam in the seventies and eighties. Uh huh. I just met her at an overland show in the uh, overland event in just outside Oxford, mm -hmm. and I thought, "Hang on a minute, she's actually the lady that I read about when I was sixteen. Yeah, who gave me the inspiration to start my journey in nineteen seventy nine. Fantastic. She's passed away last year, but it's lovely to meet her. 
Oh, wow. Just so many years later, you know? Yeah, yeah. Was that fate or was that just luck or whatever it was? Who knows? Yeah. The, the, the older I get, the more, the more open I am to things that I just were just a closed door to me before, you know, everything was just black and white and logical to me before, but I do find myself now pondering and thinking, is there more to this? Is there, is there, is there someone else going on? Cause it just, so just sometimes the way things work out, you're like, that seems to be more of a coincidence. I don't more than a coincidence. I don't, I don't, I, I don't know. I don't, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> the logical just... part of your brain just goes, shut up. You make your own look. Look, get on with it. But I don't know. Sometimes um, I'm just turning. I'm just turning into an old cynic as I get older. Like. <laughs> uh, we're all, also getting asked: uh, Did you ever find out if the Colombian pharmaceutical businessman who let you camp on his land survived the cartel wars? <laughs> <laughs> no, I never found out. I, never, I don't think I got his name. But it would be interesting to find out who he was. And how he, how he made this funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, again, folks, you got to read the book. You just got to read the book. There's so many of these sort of chance meetings and things. You can draw your own conclusions as to who that was. Um, if you were to do a round the world trip today, what bike would you do it on? Want to go see the man? Yeah, that's it. Why? Why? Why use saying? anything else? Yeah. yeah. Why, why did you? Else? Why did I you mean, take the motor guzzy? Um, because. Uh, I was too stubborn. I reckon it was the best motorbike in the world in the seventies. Yeah. It was the hottest bike out there. Um, I'd had a BMW before that, and I realised that was more of a touring bike. And I was going to buy another BMW. And I was too stubborn because I wasn't getting a decent price from a motor guzzy. So I thought, bugger you, I'll take it mm. instead. Yeah. So I put a screen on it and uh, a couple of top boxes, and did everything that the BMW would ever do. Only look better, look, look a lot cooler at the time, and a quarter <laughs> of the price. Of course, the price. Yes. He asks, "What three pieces of advice would you both give to potential round the world travellers?" That's a question to both of us. Oh uh, God, three pieces of advice. Um, um, don't overthink it. Would be my main one. That after, yeah. after being involved with a couple of uh, the Overland Show and the uh, Adventure R- R- Adventure Riders Show. People have got so much in thought goes into the what the bike they're going to take, what equipment they're going to take, what they're yeah. going to wear, what they're going yeah. to. You know, it's all just nonsense. Just get on your bike and go. You know, it doesn't yeah. matter. It doesn't matter. You got a motor goes to the mall or BMW, or whatever. You know, a Honda monkey bike. Just get on your bike. People go around the world on a scooter and a Honda Everything. 50 or whatever. Everything you can think of. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's only ten thousand miles to India. You know, what bike can you? It's kind of you, you. What bike can you do ten thousand miles on? You know that's a crazy thing, isn't it? It's like it's it's not as far as you think. It's not it. It doesn't need to be as big a journey as as you as you think. It, it, it's crazy. I remember I remember getting to Australia. I know I didn't take forty three years, but I remember getting to Australia and it had been a year and a bit, I think. And then you suddenly realise twenty four hours I can be home. <laughs> you know, you know what I mean. It's like yeah, you're not yeah. really that far away in the great in the great scheme of things. Uh, yeah, de- I definitely agree with you. People plan it's over not plan. The bike, you, you you're going on a motorbike, but it's not the bike that's important. The bike is just the means. Yeah, of getting the journey done. You know, it's like yeah. going into town on the bus. It's not the bus that's important. It's the fact you're going into town. Yeah, you know, the bike's just the means of getting you there. So it's. You want a bike that's not going to break down, blah, 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 it's going to be comfortable, the rest of it, but people just overthink the whole thing. Yeah. Do you know do you know Jacques Lucasen, the Dutch guy that um, did like a four or five year trip around the world on, was it an R1 or a Fireblade? I can't remember what he did it on. But that was in the 90s. Did you, did you know about him? I haven't heard of him, no. no. Incredible guy, incredible. Well, he was at um, a, a, a hub event, Horizons Unlimited, so I was at yeah. that before I did my trip, and I think I was I was given a talk about my planned trip. And I remember being in the bar afterwards, and Jack was there, and he was a bit of a hero of mine. So you know, he was a bit pissed because he likes a beer, and and I'd had a few. So I got chatting with him, and I told him about my plans, and he just beamed with a big smile, and I said, you know, can, do you think the bike will make it? Will I be able to do it? And uh, he just looked at me and he said, he said just. Just take the bike that makes you smile because he said any bike yeah. can break down. 
Any bike is just mm. two wheels and an engine. A bike is a, as you just said, a bike is a bike. So you want the bike that you have the connection with, the bike that makes you smile. Because at the end of the day, that's all you're going to have at some points. Yeah. And I'm so glad I listened to him, and he's totally right. Because when you're, when when at the times when I was just feeling, you know, quite low and really shite, I could look across out my tent, and there's my bike, and you just think, that's my yeah. bike. I've ridden that from home, you know, and. It, it was just, it was just been there. awesome. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I love yeah. the fact people would go, "Oh, you'll never do that." People still see that, say that to me now. Oh, that bike will never make it. And you're like, finished. Yeah. Living years ago, you know. <laughs> you must I get said that. that Seventy nine, yeah. 79, exactly. Of, yeah. Exactly. Did a forty years later on a forty year old motorbike, you know. I, I love the fact that you 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 did it again on the same bike. That's brilliant. I love that. Um, yeah, That's you're totally right. P- people over plan. Um, put too much thought into whatever bike it is. And as we just said, just don't give up. Loads of, loads of people say, oh, I would love to do that. Or I, I want to do, I want to do a world trip. Most people will never do it, will they? Because it's not, they just want to do it. They don't need to do it. And for me, I think no. that's, I think that's the big difference. You have to, it's got to be in your soul. Like you have to really want to do that trip for it to, to make it happen. That, that, that's yeah, my you know, view. I mean, it took me five years, five years to plan it, and then it all mm. fell to shit whenever <laughs> yeah. I left. Yeah. So yeah. it wasn't going to stop, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then this yeah. time, whenever they c- couldn't go on, I wasn't going to stop. Yeah, never give up. Just got to have that there mentality. Go. Just go on, you know. Um, right, Chris. That's all the patron questions, mate. But there's a couple over on Instagram. Have you got time for them? Yep. Apologies for interrupting, folks, but a quick shout out for this week's sponsors, who this week are Ultimate Add-ons. Bit of spiel to read out for them. Ultimate Add-ons are the premium manufacturer of mobile phone and action camera mounting solutions for motorcycles. With a kit for any bike and a proven track record of creating products that keep your devices safe, secure and easily accessible, the Ultimate Add-ons product range is ideal for any rider from the commuter to the -the round-the-world adventurer. Why shell out on an expensive GPS system when you could use your smartphone, keeping it charged and within reach to take photos of your travels at the same time? Ultimate add-ons, waterproof, shockproof, and dustproof tough cases are available for all f- are available for all flagship smartphone models and are designed by riders for riders. Find out why Ride Magazine gives Ultimate Add-ons their coveted Best Buy certification. Keep riding this winter with Ultimate Add-ons. It's all about the journey. Now, if you head to Ultimate Add-ons, links down below, it's just Ultimate with A-D-D-O-N-S, all one word, ultimateaddons.com. Use the code TPOT1, that's TPOT with O N E at the end, teapot one, then you'll get 10% off their entire product range. That also works for Dango Design UK as well. I've never had any vibration issues with the cases that I use. Uh, I've got one for my iPhone and I use the hex sort of strap. It's in the pedal cycle section. It's just like a ratchet strap, which allows you to pretty much attach it to absolutely anything. And then your, your case attaches to that. So a massive thank you to Ultimate Add-ons for their continued support. We are also sponsored by the Influencer Store. Now, Roger and Charlotte over at the Influencer Store, they've been doing my merch for teapot1.com for quite a few years now. I used to use the standard sort of print-on-demand type web-based ones. Uh, Yeah, it was nice and easy to do that, but the quality of the products were two or three washes and they fell apart they'd lose their shape and I wasn't really happy for my brand to be associated with that sort of quality so I was on the hunt for some better quality merch I saw Richie Vida stuff and thought that's really good nice quality really nice print like the designs and he pointed me in the direction of Roger and Charlotte over at the influencer store at the influencer store and they've been doing my merch ever since I get the feedback from you guys when you spend your hard-earned money on the merch and you seem to be happy with it if you're not please do let me know and we can feed it back but I've got some spiel to read out from them the influencer store helps you build your brand big or small providing you with a solution and apparel we help you to increase your fan base while supporting you with starting your own influencer clothing line with nothing more than just an idea or design and there are no hidden costs for more info come check us out at influencerstore.co.uk or drop us an email at online at influencerstore.co.uk for more 
information. And lastly, a massive shout out to all of you over in the clan, over at uh, patreon.com forward slash teapot one. Could not do this without all your support, folks. We've got a fantastic community going on over there. Everyone's so supportive of each other. We do the ride outs, we do the meetups, and obviously you guys get first choice for the questions on the podcast. Thank you so much for all your support. I hope you're all still enjoying it. Let's get back to the podcast. Right, okay, we'll fire across to Instagram. I think there's only three, I think, over on Instagram for us to get through. There's loads of people saying they've read the book or they can't wait to read the book and looking forward to it. It's three actual questions. So that's um, uh, at teapot1insta is my tag. Uh, I'll leave Chris's as well down below, so make sure you check them out and give them a follow. First one, uh, a Simon Jacklin. One question I always wonder about is financing these long journeys in faraway places. Food, fuel, repair, repairs, clothing, etc. Do you work locally for a short period and then move on? I'm just interested. Thanks for recommendation. Uh, I will get it. I also have a guzzy and I love that too. Yeah, so funding the trip. Did you get the funds together before you went? Or was it? Well, as I said earlier, yeah, it was a bit of a nightmare because it was only yeah. s- s- been working part time, saving the money up. As I said, it was about a grand, which is I worked out it was about five grand now, mm-hmm. which, as you can imagine, isn't an awful lot to travel around the world on. No, <laughs> this the journey I did to Australia recently last year. Um, I'm substantially better off, as you say, <laughs> uh, so I can afford to stay in hotels and not worry about <laughs> petrol. And, Go to the restaurants. I didn't do much camping. Camping was more or less as an emergency. Yeah. So I did spoil myself a bit more. But yeah, it's um, you know you're going to be away for whatever time. You're not going to be earning any money. Um, you're going to be spending money. It depends how high and hog you want to live. Yeah. But money is. They say money isn't everything, but it's pretty much everything when you're on the road because you can't go far without it. Yeah. And if you you can't find us, you know, you do get a. a harder time if you're poor if you don't have money if you don't can't afford a nice hotel or a hotel at all life's going to be harder for you the more money you mm-hmm. have the better yeah yeah absolutely it's a I horrible mean, it, it's a horrible thing to say but it's the way it is you know it, uh, absolutely you know that there's people like have you heard of nathan millward yeah 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 so like Madam, no, yeah cracking lad he, did he the wrote back the, with him. yeah the posty bike, yeah, the one one ten cc Aussie post posty bike. Well, he yeah. rode that from Sydney back to the UK, and I think his budget was something like seven or eight grand. But he was literally, you know, sleeping in bushes and living off of. I think yeah. at one stage it was one like ninety nine p cheeseburger a, a day. That was that was his his rations. Yeah. So you know you can do it at the literally bottom level you're just getting by yeah but then and there's you, other people you, you can do it for a lot less than you need yeah, yeah i mean so so, so places like i mean iran mm-hmm. i think petrol was 10 cents a gallon yeah. 10 cents a yeah. liter yeah you know hotels are like 30 bucks for a holiday inn type thing you know yeah 30 dollars yeah. so you can live a lot cheaper in these places than you can and travel a lot cheaper than you can in the west yeah absolutely but, um You'd, probably the last trip I did flights were the most expensive part of it hmm. and you, you can certainly yeah. work along the way and it's never been easier especially now you know if, if if you work I mean if you've got access to the internet and you need the internet for work then you can work pretty much anywhere in the world these days so yeah. you know there's no reason why you couldn't do that and 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 you can even turn your trip into a source of income these days you know with, with social media and everything that's out there as long as you can you can develop your brand and, and get a following. Like we had uh, Bobby Bolton and Marie on here from One Life Truck It. They are currently driving a big truck to Australia at the moment. And like Bobby set off himself from the UK, just just him and his dog, basically, with no real sort of following. And in a matter of weeks, he's now got like 200 odd or quarter of a million people following on his Instagram. Oh. Mm. Well, he, I mean, he's now Terrible. becoming a brand, so you know you can do that. But there's there's pros and cons for that because if it sort of doesn't become your trip anymore, you need to make sure you keep hold of of your baby. You know what I mean, and don't sell the soul out of it because yeah. then you're just going to be in the I pocket to the sponsors. Suppose the trip to not to an extent, yeah. you know, because you're yeah. you're working, you're just working to publicize yeah. yourself. You know, yeah, uh, yeah. What are you actually getting away from? About, when I talked about taking the bike to Australia the second time, I spoke to a couple of TV companies and said, yeah, we could 
bring a cameraman with you to the mm. Ewan McGregor type thing. I thought, no, I don't want to do that. You know, because you can imagine driving in a little village yeah. with yourself and a lot of cameras behind you. You think, you know, it's just not going to be the same. No. It's not going to be a journey. It's going to be a film yeah. or a documentary or whatever. Yeah, so it depends what you want out of it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the way I'll, I'll, the way a lot of people um, do it, Simon, and the way I did it as well is I, I had some backing. You know, I managed to pick up a sponsor that basically would pay for about half of what I needed. And then the rest of it, yeah, you, you put your head down at work and you you do as much overtime as you can to save. I, I remortgaged, I sold everything I owned and yeah. it still, you know, wasn't quite enough for, for my trip. So, you know, you, you credit card it up and you just swallow it when you get home. It's it's yeah. your trip. You have to figure out the way that you're going to fund it. And if you have the time, if you can get somewhere like the States, you can get a job or yep. make some money yep. on the time. I think that's a great way of doing it because... By working and stopping and working in a place, you're getting to know the people, getting to know the yeah. place and getting to know the culture. Mm-hmm. The trouble is you can only do that place. It's like, you know, if you're in India or something like that, you can't do that because you'd only be getting pennies rather than yeah. pounds to, to yeah. make money. You know, But if you're traveling through the States or somewhere in Europe, you can do that. Stop, make some money. Great. Mm. Really builds the trip, I think. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. I think, Simon, you just have to... You have to figure out what you know what your trip is to you, what you want from the trip, and if you're prepared to work along the way, great. If you're not, then you just have to. You've got to source the money somehow before you go and and make sure that's that. It'll never be enough. <laughs> You'll always no. need more, but you know it's part of the joy of it. You but, just deal with it. And part of the joy is, I mean, looking back, it's like it was held the time, but part of the time in Africa certainly was went hungry, went thirsty, you know, and yeah. it's. It's part of the trip because you don't do that at home. When does that? Yeah. You, you think you're, you say you're starving, you miss your lunch. Yeah. Well, actually, you're starving. You haven't eaten for a couple of days. You're, you're mm. thirsty when you can't taste. You can't swallow. The back of your throat's dry. You know. But yeah. Whereas we think we're thirsty. We just need another beer. <laughs> so it does give you a different perspective in life. You know. Yeah. I I, I never experienced that on my trip. I you know I, I maybe went a day without some food, um, and um, did I go? I always managed to find something to drink. Although I remember I remember drinking out a waterfall in Laos and really regretting that later that night. <laughs> when, when, when basically my arse just exploded out of me for the next few days. <laughs> and I, I got dengue I remember, fever as well. So uh, yeah, that might have uh, been from there. Yeah. <laughs> I remember being, like, the, being really thirsty in Africa. Like, really, really thirsty. And the guy gave me a tin mug with muddy water in it. Looking at me. Yeah. Am I going to drink this or not? Uh, I drank it, you know. Yeah. <laughs> because you the have to. It was worse, you know. Yeah. You have to, you know. Well, I remember that this waterfall was really fast flowing, like a proper waterfall, you know, fast flowing water. Yeah. And um, I I've been that. drinking like Gatorade. I had a big bottle of of like Gatorade strapped across the front of my bike, so I'd finished that. And I remember just filling the bottle up from the waterfall, and it was crystal clear yeah. water, crystal clear. Yeah. And I remember drinking it and just thinking, this is the best water I've ever had. And wow, it, it got its <laughs> revenge on me. <laughs> yeah, she was, did it get its revenge on me. Uh, right, the next one, Uncle Bob's Bike Life. He just asks, why Moto Guzzi? Well, we've we've covered that. Uh, last one, Real Schwerty. I haven't read the book. How do you make a living along... Oh, there we go, same thing. How do you make a living along the way? Will, will you get a pension back... Uh, oh yeah, will you get a pension back home or in any country at all? Because you've not, you know, you do, you're not working, I suppose, or, or is or is he now depending on income from the book and event talks? Yeah, but I mean, well, your trip was like a year and a half, wasn't it? Two years, so you've you've had yeah. forty odd years to to pay into the system. Bigger few quid since, yeah, yeah, so paid my yeah. pension. Uh, I don't think I think it's very difficult to get the old person to make money out of a trip, but as recovered. That's not why you should be doing it. I don't think anyway, personally. Mm. Uh, it's a bit cheap. It seems to put a million followers. She must be making a nice living out of it. But she's really, got to be doing very well. Yeah, yeah. Got to be doing very well. If you think you're going to make money out of it, forget about it. Do it for the fun, not for the money. Aye. Make some money before you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Or else get plenty of credit cards, as you say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because I mean, there's there's very few people out there who it becomes a way of life. You know, there's Simon and Lisa Thomas, who, but even they've had what, three, four years off because of COVID, obviously they ended up back in the UK and they, they've been nearly mm-hmm. 20 years on the road, you know, before, before COVID came along. But there's not many people out there that travel 
for a prolonged period like that where it actually becomes life. So no. most people, most folk out there, you know, you can swallow a couple of years out of your life to go and live your dream and, you know, I would say get out of your system, but you won't. It'll still be there when you get back. <laughs> yeah. You're indoctrinated. Um, yeah, yeah. It was weird because I remember, like, it's not like this. It's not like this epiphanal thing, is it? Or not? Epiphanal's the wrong word. But it's not like this miracle cure for any sort of issues in life that you have before you go. It certainly wasn't for me. I think I finished no, the quite, quite the opposite. Yeah, quite the you opposite, finish it with more dilemmas and issues than you did before you went. <laughs> totally. Yeah. You go. You go to try and find yourself, and you end up completely yeah. screwing your head up. Yeah, you come back going, who the fuck am I? <laughs> who am I now? <laughs> so yeah, don't do it for that either. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, Chris, that's all the questions, mate. And um, I've kept you for like, gee whiz, I were on a, almost two hours. <laughs> so I, I really appreciate that. I've really enjoyed it, mate. Um, I'm sorry, because you, you contacted me ages ago about coming on here. And uh, it took me... Oh God, I think about a year before I actually downloaded the book and well, I've had I've had the book. I've had the book there. I've just never had the chance to um to read it. So if you're like me, folks, and you don't get the time or don't think you have the time to sit and read a book, get the audio book. And uh, I'll guarantee you you'll be hooked. You'll have it done in a couple of days. It's awesome. So there'll be links down below for for that. Um Chris, is there any is there anything else you want to chat about? Are there any shout outs you want to give? Feel free. Stage is yours. You want to plug, you want to plug the book, you want to plug websites, anything. I suppose probably one of the things that it covers was actually the writing of the book is, um, which has been as dramatic a, a story as for me, I know as, as the trip itself, um, I was never an intellectual, never did very well at school. Mm. Um, probably dyslexic teacher. So it was stupid. All the rest of it, but uh, I think if I can write a book and get it the bestsellers list on Amazon, really anybody can. It's been quite a mind blowing ex uh, experience for me writing the book. Mm. Apart from bringing all the, the stories about the trip back, but uh, you know, I think most people have a book in them, and it's it's not an easy thing to do. But it, you know, there's, there's no reason why you can't do that as well. Yeah. Um, and get a lot out of that. Probably maybe get a lot more out of that than positively than actually doing a journey in the first how, place. How did you find really it reliving? How did you find it reliving the trip again? Like writing the book and reliving all those experiences. Um, quite strange in a way because a lot of stuff. There's been a lot of things that have happened in the forty years since then. Mm. I was lucky that I'd basically written a manuscript when I was twenty-two when I came home. So I'd written a story as a as a twenty two year old. So it was it was quite lovely reading the as a sixty odd year old reading what yeah. I was thinking and what I was doing when I was twenty two, and it all brought memories back. It's all in the brain, the back of the brain somewhere. It's all fogged up with years of alcohol and drug abuse and <laughs> other things going on, mm. but it's all been in there. And you get the story, start reading your diaries and reading the journals and looking at the photographs and writing it down. And I suppose one of the ways it's described is like scraping paint off a piece of wood, you know, you're scraping layers and layers off. And eventually what actually happens comes back to you quite clearly. You know, it's made, it's all in the back of your head somewhere. It's like, it's all memorized somewhere, but it just takes a while to, to get it out again. Yeah. That's what beauty about photographs and diaries, it certainly helps jog the memory to get to do that. Yeah. But, yeah. um, no, it was, it was a, Wonderful thing because I've been able to contact again, as I say, the guy in Israel, the guy in Scotland I went met before, and guys in Australia that I've travelled with. Not talking to somebody for forty years and then meeting up with them, and after five minutes you're talking as if you've met them there, you hadn't seen them for a year, maybe sort of thing. It's awesome. fantastic, you know. But yeah, so you got to buy the book. It's, uh, Chris Donaldson World is my website. Chris Donaldson World or Amazon. Company we love and hate at the same time. <laughs> yeah, you self-published on Amazon. Guys, is that right? Self-published on Amazon. Yeah, those yeah, guys who are taking over the world. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. Uh, but they do such a this incredible company. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, it works, doesn't the, it? it? It works. It works. Yeah, and it's tremendous. It means that the likes of yourself and myself can write a book and have it read all over the world. So yeah. It's pretty amazing. It's, technology has brought so much into the world that you've sort of become so used to it, you don't think about mm. it anymore. But actually, 
stop and think. It's, it is totally amazing. I mean, we're so fortunate, aren't we, now to be in this position? For sure, for sure. It's I I, I found myself when I was listening to the book. I found myself sort of just almost trying to put myself into your shoes back then. You know, like I I could I could um familiar no familiar, what's the word uh what's the word you know I like I I would listen to you talking about certain situations and I could think I had a similar sort of thing not on the same level but I had a similar sort of thing here but as we discussed I've got that I've got my phone in my pocket and I've got almost almost instant access to you know the thunderbirds if I need them I can just hit the big red yeah. button please help and I remember <laughs> just thinking to myself oh you 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 had none of that you know you're just totally winging it on your own by hook by pray, by prayer by your wits and uh wow I, I remember thinking that's fucking amazing but also, oh my God, <laughs> like, did did you did you appreciate that at the time? Like, Not at the you, time, you, no, whatever. You were on your own there. I knew it was on my own, but so, certainly looking back on it, when you read about the sort of Victorian explorers when they were mm. doing it mm. completely without anything at all, any communication or knowing what was going on and look at what we're doing now, I was certainly closer to them at that stage mm. than I was um, to what's going on now, but... As I say, what you do now is what do, what is the norm. Yeah. I think before that was old, I think you somewhere in the future, who knows, uh, yeah. in the future. So it is, it's, uh, it was a tremendous experience. And the, somebody said to me, a good adventure is one that's hell at the time, but you can think fondly of it back when you're sitting in the pub later. Absolutely. So it certainly had a few of them. Folks, read the book. Please, just read the book. Even if you've got no intention to do anything like this, just read the book. It's phenomenal. Cracking job, Chris. Thanks, Cracking job. Love it. Absolutely loved it. Um, yeah, folks, all the links for the books and everything, Chris's socials, his website, that will all be down below. So if you're watching the video, have a look at the vid description. If you're listening to the podcast, have a look at the uh, show notes and it will all be there. All the links will be there. So make sure you give Chris a follow as well. Uh, Chris, loved it. Absolutely loved it, mate. Been an absolute pleasure to chat with you. Really appreciate you giving up your evening to me. You too, Bruce. Been a pleasure. And folks, if you've enjoyed this one, please um, hit the like, hit the subscribe. If you're watching the videos, if you're listening, uh, try and leave us a little review. That'd be awesome. We're sort of top three in the um, UK automotive uh, podcast. So yeah, leave a little review and see if we can bump it a wee bit higher. That'd be awesome. All right, folks, hope you've enjoyed this one. Keep doing your thing. Get on out there whenever you can. Look after those that you love. But most importantly, most importantly, live your life. Woo-ha! Dude, Mint, I loved it. Let me just stop this.